What's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode. What are we on? 129, I think. Yeah, 129 with another experimental title. Uh, Tuesday, we had an experimental title uh, talking about does this title matter? And then we talked about measuring the things that matter. Today, we're testing another experimental title, another interesting title, and talking about testing different things. And so this is a YouTube experiment for us. We're going to test with like uh, having an interesting title during the live stream and then maybe modifying that to a more formalized title afterwards and playing with the algorithm. But today we're talking all about testing different things, whether that's in your workflow, whether that's with Webflow, testing your career, finding ways to you know make money in this wild world. So um, damn, I was just about ready to go into before we get too far into this and then, ugh, but then it's Thursday and Joe and I were just talking about this. We need a thing. We need like the, uh, I need that little transition moment right there, man. <laughs> How you doing, Joe? Doing really well, doing really well. Can we call that a, a completely successful intro? Yeah, I, I think, think so. so. Hold up. Yeah. yeah. I think you need a little background music too. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. Well, I'm happy. My Wi-Fi problems are completely fixed now. So now all of the, the stress is on you. I'm completely free from it. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's on me now, huh? Jin Chua. Hello. First time here. Nice. Zavi oh, is hey, here. Jin. Is it yeah, Javi? Zavi? What was it? Who was it you were talking to? Just talking to Jen on Twitter. Oh, nice. Yeah, interested in doing the, the client first translations. We'll oh. get to that. Yeah, let's, yeah. Um, we could throw that announcement up. We could talk about that right now. You can, we can skip that to that announcement. Let's say what's up to Rahul. Dale Jensen's in the house. Hello to Net. Robert, what's up? Uh, Harsh is here. Head above the rest. Okay, Aida. Hello, Michael Collins. What's up, Sean? Hello, everyone. Yeah, Joe, tell them. What are, what are we looking at? You, you want, uh, we, we want to get some client first translations in the house before we get into the topic today. Yeah, sure. Let's talk client first translations. Last weekend, I posted a, a tweet about different languages in client first. We had a couple people interested in Spanish, a couple people interested in French. And I said, what else can we do? Who else is out there that wants to translate the English based client docs, client first docs into their preferred language, their native language. And we had a lot of responses. We're getting a lot of emails. And in case you're not on Twitter, in case you missed it, we wanted to share it here on the stream. So we are looking for people to come and translate the new V2 client docs to a different language. And the idea is that we can bring client first to more people around the world, not just people that are fluent in English. And this is really important to me. I live in a, a country where English is not the primary language and most people don't speak English. So being able to give this knowledge in other languages is just so important. So I'll be sharing the link in the comments here. Check it out. It's an invitation to be a translator. And if you're interested, you can answer on that invitation. Nice. Great. Uh, and that link will also be in the uh, YouTube description. If you're watching this later on and you can't find that comment, uh, you can look in the YouTube description and find that as well. Uh, okay, so next announcement, we also wanted to just give a big welcome to the more than 550 uh, pro members. On Tuesday, we announced, uh, we, somebody asked how many there were, and we said it was 300 plus, it's actually 550 plus. So anyway, we sent out the first monthly newsletter to, uh, today, this morning. Um, and anyway, uh, we noticed a couple inconsistencies on the way that was formatted, so we'll, we'll, get, we'll get that cleaned up, but um, that's going. We've got the pros only hangout. Uh, we're gonna talk about attributes. So Joe's got a list of attributes. We've been collecting potential feature updates and uh, refinements to attributes. So our pros only hangout, we'll be discussing that. Uh, we'll be looking for feedback about what you'd like to see with attributes or uh, maybe voting even on some of the, the suggestions that we have, right, Joe? Yeah, we have a lot of new attributes to develop throughout the year. This isn't a next month thing, it's not in two months, it's throughout the rest of the year. But we wanna know what to prioritize on. So to our pros, we're going to present all of the potential attribute solutions and then have people vote on it. See what the most needed solutions are, see what people want, and whatever comes to the top of the list is what we're going to start with. So that's for pros and that is Wednesday. Yeah, I two, Wednesdays two Wednesdays from, from, from now. today. Two Wednesdays. Yeah. Yep. 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 Nice. That'll be nice. Yeah. And you can take the next one too, Joe. The preview. We're going to take a look oh, at Joe's. Yes. We're going to take a look at Joe's ass. Yes. Tomorrow <laughs> we're previewing the ass, the automated support service for attributes. 
And what this is, is a tool that will let you check your attributes implementation and see any potential issues that you have with it. Maybe there's an attribute that's not spelled correctly or out of place or on the wrong element, or you're missing a required attribute. The S is going to let you know. And this is completely automated. You don't have to even speak to a human. You don't have to wait for support time because we found that a lot of issues are just really small things. You misspelled this. You put this on the wrong nested parent. And we can now identify those without somebody on staff looking at it. So we will be reviewing that tomorrow. And tomorrow is our first product update stream, which I'm okay. really excited about. Ryan Mart, more on that. What are yeah. we doing tomorrow? Yeah, Who's we're here? hanging with Alex Iglesias tomorrow to learn all about um, product updates, what we've been working on, what's upcoming, uh, technical questions. Y'all have been asking to have some technical Q&A. So you'll be able to come and ask, you know, whatever you want. Uh, we may not answer all of the questions, but we'll do our best uh, like we usually do to just kind of riff off the fly and um, do some of that. So uh, that'll be tomorrow in our same stream time. So 12 p.m. Uh, and bring the pizza. Bring the pizza. <laughs> bring the pizza. I will be bringing the pizza. I have after work today, I have a whole thing planned where I am preparing a pineapple pizza and a pineapple pizza salad. <laughs> yeah, I know, wild. So I'll be documenting the process. I'll be taking some photos. And tomorrow on the stream, we will take a look at that. And we'll see if we can get that 50-50 pineapple, no pineapple, swaying more to the pineapple side. That's funny. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Okay, uh, for our final announcement, um, we you may have seen this little tweet from Melissa. Huh? <clears throat> Wonder what these people have planned. Uh, and you see myself, you see Melissa, Melissa uh, Jesse, you see Johnny Gomez and Colleen here. And you know when we're together, uh, we're up to no good. So we're maybe planning a potential in-person pizza party. Uh, and I guess the clue will be, what do the five of us have in common? Uh, other than our love for Webflow. So sometime in early September, you know, that's all the teas we'll give on that. But we're going to think about maybe doing an in-person pizza party. So keep your eyes peeled for some of that. <laughs> maybe a that's food it, fight. Pizza? Maybe a food fight. Yeah, just pizza. Nice. Nothing else will happen at the, at the meetup or the event. <laughs> just, just pizza. A big pizza buffet. Hawaiian on one side, everything else on the other. Yeah. Really separate the crowd. Nice. That's right. <laughs> okay. Great. So I Anything think that's else for announcements. All, nope. I think that's all the announcements. Okay. Um, cool. Okay. So let's get into disclaimers. Uh, first disclaimer is we wrote this in outline an hour ago. So <laughs> yep. we're kind of shooting off the hip here. Um, we also did not send an, uh, an email. So I did not send an email reminder this week. So again, just testing to see what uh, part of the audience is uh, coming from YouTube directly what part of the audience is coming from you know us pushing people directly uh so lots of lots of tests happening this week with youtube uh we'll be back to some regular stuff next week but um this whole episode today is talking about why testing so we wrote this an hour ago but also we're testing our workflow stuff so um a continuation on what we started tuesday about how much time do we spend prepping for some of these and how much of this can kind of be spontaneous off the cuff um and what you know how is it received by the community by the audience etc so let us know in the comments uh do you like this type of format um as we get through this you know um or do you prefer the more structured, more specific, you know, knowing exactly kind of what you're getting with the title preset at a time, knowing, hey, we're gonna talk about this specific thing. Uh, so let us know what you think about that experimentation. So those are those are disclaimers. Joe, anything to add to those disclaimers? Well, I have to say, this is one of our, our tests and we have maybe the lowest watch count that we've had in months. Mm -hmm on this stream. Correct. So I wonder maybe that email, the email is probably is doing some uh -huh. some do, some good work. Correct. But that's part of testing. That's the beautiful part of testing. Now we know that this email has a significant impact on the people that that show up. Well, the next test will be does the email need to be big and detailed or could it just be hey, it's Thursday, reminder we're live and a click to the link. So that'll be the next test. So expect maybe next week you get a very simple email saying hey, we're live and it's just a live notification rather than, so again, and, and if that doesn't uh, play out, you know, we'll go 
back to full length things, you know? So again, just, just testing out little different uh, things, especially because um, it's no big deal doing this twice a week. But our goal is to get to five times a week or maybe even more than just one hour in some of these days. So maybe there's a morning session or a, a noon session or a you know different. And so we're trying to figure out, like, can we optimize in certain places? Where will we lose if we you know, like where if we pull back in one place, does that affect other things that are vital or can we get away with some of that? And so, again, just uh, testing and playing and checking, which is going to be the theme of the whole episode today. So. Nice. OK, are we that's it? Are, are we into story time here? Uh, yeah, the audience prompt, maybe. We just ask people what they're okay. maybe experimenting with. So are you yes. yeah, are you experimenting with anything interesting, uh, a <clears throat> business model, a product, uh, you know, a building community, something like that? Are you experimenting with anything that you're, like, constantly iterating on, live, testing with stuff? Um, not necessarily live streaming, but, I mean, just, like, playing in real time, testing things live. So, And that, that could be services that you offer. Maybe you're testing an e-commerce solution that you're offering to clients. Maybe you're testing uh, a, a new pricing model, mm -hmm. right? There's, there's so many different things that we can test and it could be a micro test. It could be a test that's a year long, but just share anything here. We'd love to go through these comments and talk about what you're testing. Great. Yeah. Great. So let us know. And I see this one, um, Tyler. Oh, I'm flying to any IRL event. Yeah. Nice. Flying a pizza. Can't wait. Um, Yes, Great. we will make formal announcements about that in the next couple of weeks. We will have some some really big announcements about um, about that kind of things. OK, <laughs> all right. Uh, let's see. Forgot Rahul says here that he, I forgot we're streaming today. Holidays made things to Saturday. OK, mm -hmm. uh, try testing a oh. thumbnails with eyes popped, jaw dropped and a finger point. Yeah, trust me, we have shot some of those and we've experimented with that and um, <laughs> didn't really like how they turned out. So we might do some more of that down the road, um, but maybe after some better photography. Retro says, might also be stream fatigue. There's been a lot of content which lately, uh, oh, well, content to watch lately. Definitely not complaining, but it might be the case. Sure, maybe that there's you know too much. I don't know if that's the, the case though. Um, it's been fairly consistent recently. I would imagine that that email uh, probably has a little bit to do with that. Okay, so story time, nice. Joe, set it up. Oh no, yeah, yeah, we can go into we can go into story time. Let's just go right yeah. into story time. Okay, story time. First, we're talking about how we've we were testing our careers before we got into Webflow. Everything before Webflow, I really saw as a test until I got to Webflow, and then once I was there, that's that's when I felt okay. This is this is what I want to do long term. This is this is how I'm moving forward. But before that. A lot of testing and it started with me working as a sales director for a SaaS startup totally unrelated to websites i led a cold calling team of it was anywhere between eight to 15 people throughout the the two years and really unrelated to to websites we had a mobile app but i was on a completely different team and I got really interested in the websites because a web app that we needed for sales was not working. The tool to help us log our sales, we literally couldn't enter our sales into the mobile app. And this was really frustrating, right? The team is doing such a good job and then they enter their sales into the dashboard and nothing. Mm. The app didn't populate the, the, the results. <laughs> So I, I started to get into it. I started to get very interested. Um, and the company started going down and down and down. There were major tech problems all the way through the company. So it started to really get to nothing without any revenue. And because of this, we couldn't even afford simple landing page design and development. So our page wasn't that good. It was a little bit outdated. And I said, you know what? Let me try to get into this. Let me do a little test. Can I be the one that helps create our new landing page? Can I help make this company look a little bit better so that maybe we have a chance to continue living? And I found this, this platform, this tool in 2014 called Macaw. And this was the first that I ever saw of this kind. Uh, this is like a Webflow type platform. And this was 2014. So early, this is around when Webflow was starting. And this was around for a few years already. 
And I was so excited to learn this. I, I, I found this and I was just thrilled. I'm going to be a website designer. I'm going to be a web developer. And I'm not going to write any code. And I'm going to do it all visually. And the videos were so cool. I was so, so excited. So I gave it a test. And I, after work each day, I would spend a few hours trying to build on this thing. Built the, built the website. Built the new website that looked much better. But the product developers at the company turned it down. Our app developers said, hey, we, we actually can't work with this. It must have been using not the best code, not the best um, HTML system, CSS. I don't know exactly, but it was rejected. We couldn't use it. So they said, if you want to do something, you got to go WordPress. So I said, okay, let me test this WordPress thing. Again, another test, right? The Macaw failed. Now I'm going to test in WordPress. And it works. And just to just to reemphasize, you're like trying to solve a specific problem for the company here, right? Like you're trying to like yeah. you're experimenting to try to build a landing page for this business or for this app that you were like working exactly. with, right? Exactly. And I went to go and do WordPress. And I did it. I actually built the site on WordPress. It looked terrible because you you know it required CSS. You had to have a little bit of knowledge, but it worked. And I built it and it was exciting. So we now had this new web page. I was the one that built it, the head of sales. And I just kept using WordPress, experimenting with it, excited about it. It's cool. I'm putting live websites up. So I was making landing pages for this company and I was making personal sites. I made a website for a party that we had and you had, there was a little RSVP password thing. It was so cool. I was excited. And that is what transitioned me into the web, mm -hmm. trying to solve this one specific problem at this company and trying to make a website to fix that problem. And that, as you all know, transitioned into Webflow. So if there wasn't that problem at the company, there's a chance that I would have never, ever got into websites. Mm -hmm. And it was all just consistent, consistent testing until I found that sweet spot in Webflow. And how, so how long was that from 14, from McCall, you know, from, from this guy to, yeah. to find in Webflow? How, so this was 2014. How long was it before you, like 2016, you found Webflow? I think it Webflow was a year, year and a year? half. Yeah. A year and a half. Maybe it hit two years, but yeah, I was, I was building in WordPress for about a year and a half professionally as a, a full-time job for about six months. Yeah. Were you making all your income from that stuff or were you getting other income from somewhere else? Like what was your, like at the time, what was your, um, like what was your setup? You know, nothing, no income, that was it incomeless. Yeah. Okay. And how are you yeah. existing? What was the, it was just your just scrounging by, were you living with your folks at the time or was it like, well, or was there, or were you making enough to kind of like pay rent and, and live at this point? This is a whole, this is a whole other. Let's go deep. Story. Yeah. This Emily is whole, Giordano this, got this nothing on me. Really Come cool on, one. let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Love you, Emily. <laughs> so I'm working for this company. The, the mobile app is, is going down. It's not working. And we say, Hey, this mobile app thing's not working, but we have this great, ridiculous idea to build a Bluetooth tracking system for car keys at car dealerships. Hmm. So we have this whole trilateration system where you have a little Bluetooth tracker on a car key and you find, and in, in a mobile app, you find where that car key is. This is 2015. Is this the so same, this is like is this the same people you're from before? Is the same the like same tech people. team, same? And so you're it's like, this is like trying to pivot, had, right? Yeah, okay. we had no money, but we were loving what we were doing. So we said, how can we pivot and try to make money immediately as fast as possible so we go where the money is the car dealerships car dealerships are very very high revenue so they have the money to spend on this it's a serious problem at car dealerships losing these keys mm. so instead of being paid every person in the company agreed to not be paid and instead we rented a giant mansion house where we worked out of and lived out of and that was the replacement of being paid. Okay. So for about one year, I was unpaid just living in this place. And the very small amount of money that we got went to paying this rent, 
and paying for the communal food. That's some real startup so life shit right there, Joe. It is super startup. I have some really interesting <laughs> photos of like working on these these hardware microprocessors and the mobile app. It really got me into technology. And this, I mean, this was a true test. This was like the test of all tests because not only did we not know what we were doing, but this technology did not exist. So we were really trying to build this brand new type of, of tech and it failed, but it was close. And through a lot of testing, we almost got there, mm -hmm. but ultimately at the end it failed. And when that company went under, that's when I said, Hey, now I, ha I actually have no money. I have nowhere to live. I now need to live with my parents and I'm going to try to make a little bit of money on WordPress here, making some websites. And that's how that all of that started. <laughs> it's funny because I try. I can't read the comments, y'all. I can't even look like, <laughs> <laughs> like trying to read the comments while Joe's talking. Joe is his own phase clan house, except for no crypto pump and dumps here, y'all. <laughs> Let's see. Similarly, blocks intrigued me around that time, but the code was trash. Okay. Uh, McCall ads intrigued me too before Webflow. Interesting. Uh, Dale Jensen saying, Del Deletrius? Deletrius? What do you think of the new Microsoft Power Pages? I have not seen them. Is that like a player, a new player in the space? I, yeah, interesting. I don't know. Um, so, Joe, yeah, I, we, I want that house. We could start the Webflow Mafia house. There we go. It's on. Um, maybe somewhere in... Oh, ooh, almost spilled the beans right there. Um, that's interesting. So, like, so, so then... Then you just find Webflow from there. This this thing just doesn't really go. And you find Webflow. You start selling websites, you know, and, and find your way into the community forums, selling little websites here and there. You find uh, Hello Sign shortly thereafter and just off to the races, right? Yeah, absolutely. Wow. And the, the testing continues. You always have to think of the growth in your business as a test. I want to make more money. I'm going to test out this new initiative to try to bring in more leads or mm -hmm. try to charge more money or try to offer this service that will allow me to charge more money. And it's just continuous testing. I'm going to try, I'm going to test design. I'm going to test using Webflow CMS for the first time. My first 10 sites in Webflow about did not have CMS. Mm -hmm. They were so small, they did not require a CMS. So just little. Like so when I was approached stuff? by HelloSign, yeah. When I was approached by HelloSign, it was a, a CMS, a fairly large CMS, and Webflow just released the CMS. So that was a test. I'm going to test myself in using this, and hopefully I am able to use it. Mm -hmm. And that, that test was successful, so now I offer CMS as, as a normal service for every, every project. Yeah. Yeah, and then, web, and then it becomes more powerful as the tool grows, and obviously you catch momentum. This We talk about this all the time, right? You get a client, a big client, you get somebody that you can attach a little bit of clout to, a little bit of momentum, you get a little something that lets you bump a price tier, and you start delivering sites that over-deliver on the price tier that you're in, and next thing you know, other people are like, oh, who built that site? Um, yeah, and then it starts, yeah, hopefully compounding, and, and it has. Uh, and there's lots of other decisions and steps and things that came along the way, uh, I think, between there and here, but... Um, that's all after Webflow. We're talking about pre-Webflow stuff. <laughs> yeah, pre-Webflow. Pre-Webflow. <clears throat> um, yeah, that uh, it's it's fun to look back on on some of that. I know I, I I'd heard some of that story, but I, I I had forgotten that you were trading the house and lodging kind of as as comp. Um, I don't know if I ever told. I think that maybe in the, Mexico, didn't yeah. you? Maybe at one of those. You told a little uh, bit of some of those stories yeah. at one of the yeah. dinners, I think. Um, yep. Yeah. Okay. All right, so we're getting deep here with Joe, y'all. Um, <laughs> and telling a little bit about our stories before Webflow. And so I guess uh, this makes it, that makes it my turn now, um, which I started, I'm trying to think, because I've, I've talked a little bit about this. Um, I'm trying to think, like I, I used to be corporate suit and tie, you know, guy. I was like, I was gonna, I was destined to be, like literally if the 2008 crash hadn't happened and if like lots of other events kind of around the edges of that hadn't happened, I'd probably be some dull, stiff, you know, like about ready to enter some midlife crisis right now and go buy a Corvette and like, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, Cause I was living some super stuffy life headed towards a weird corporate world um, before I found all this. Um, and this kind of stumbled into it. Like I wasn't intended on, building websites or starting a web design business or nothing. 
Um, I stumbled into it because I was uh, really trying to sell text marketing door to door. And I think I've told this story a number of times on the stream. Couldn't really sell a lot of that, but then realized along the way that people needed integrated marketing stuff and that they needed uh, landing pages and, and websites. And so the first big client that I got to pay me to build a website for them, um, I hired a web developer and they left me stranded. And so I had to build the website. And so that's what kind of got me started. But even before that, I had been interested in learning a little bit about like WordPress and um, kind of how to get online because I was a creator. I was creating, I was trying to figure out how to do some of this stuff. Um, and so that really like forced me to learn WordPress. But my goal wasn't ever to like make a business out of selling websites. You know, I thought, hey, this is good money and this is going to allow me to like do this other thing. But I had, I always wanted to, I always had a mind to build a product or to sell something because when I, when, when my world did fall apart, I decided that I didn't really want to go back into selling other people's products. You know, after so many years of just being able to walk into doors or make relationships with people and sell them lots of things all the way from. You know, when I was selling door to door office supplies, I'd walk in and maybe sell somebody a copier or just a thousand bucks worth of ink or maybe just a hundred bucks worth of ink and paper or whatever. But back in my insurance days, I was selling insurance policies that were hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know, multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars, like half a million dollars sometimes. And so crazy arc of just selling different things. And I'm like, yo, you could sell anything. You know, my mom would always tell me this, like you could sell, you know, ice to an Eskimo. She like, always make these little things like, um, and so I started saying like, well, why am I selling other people's stuff? Why not go sell me? And so that, like, I just started figuring out, like, what can I sell? And at first it was text marketing, realized that didn't sell. Then I was like, oh, hey, somebody just paid me a lot of money for this website, but I don't know how to build websites. Let me find somebody. Maybe I can outsource this, but I didn't know anything even enough to outsource it properly. So that backfired. And then I got to scramble to build websites. And so, um, I don't know, it, it kind of happens by accident. And then the creative side of me got into like video and storytelling because right after that, my blog went viral. And so then websites didn't become like a money thing for me. I was like, Hey, I make enough money doing this to keep going. But yo, look, I've, 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 I've had millions of people interact with these words that I wrote or these video that I made, you know, and that was like, how, how did this happen? How did I build this, you know? And then trying to monetize that is really what led me, you know, I, I ended up talking to some, some guy in a, you know, we, we raised like 200 grand. We spent 250 grand on building software. Uh, trying to validate all these things, got into community organizing. We held big town hall events, like did a lot of stuff all along the way. Like I'm, I was looking at this little um, thing here and we can actually pull the screen up. Um, you know, we had a big team that organized a, a massive town hall uh, and we did these two word camps. So big word camp. <laughs> Hello. Uh, I fell in love with WordPress way before I was a Webflow homer. I was back here doing the same thing in the world of WordPress. This is why I see the potential and this is why I see so many similarities. Um, we, we hosted a huge, you know, 500 plus attendees, um, you know, uh, over the course of two conferences, um, a, a number of things, you know, the WordPress meetup, like before I was doing Webflow meetups, we were doing WordPress meetups. Um, we had a young professional summit. There was a hackathon we created. So like I was really experimenting with community organizing long before I knew what I was doing online. You know, I was connecting people in weird ways. We were doing fun events. We were doing these little creative salons. Um, so many little just interesting things that like we did, I didn't really know what was happening, but I knew like when we organized something, it was fun. And when people showed up, there was just this little extra sizzle that like, it just wasn't an, a normal thing, you know? Um, <laughs> we can maybe bring up that, uh, that town hall event that we did where we played this red light, green light with the candidates and just, you know, things like that, where even today, like literally it's been five years, the town hall was in 2017. And to this day I had dinner with somebody and they're like, yeah, that town hall event, I'd never been to anything like that. And you know, to make local politics fun, like I just got obsessed with that. So the blending of testing of lo like local community building and technology and storytelling and multimedia and somehow seeing that we're living in a world where all these things are kind of wrapping up into one destination, I just became obsessed. And I, it didn't matter how much money I made or what I was going, I just wanted to be doing more of that. You know, and that again, you know, over time leads to where we are here. You know, and so it's like, it's such a crazy path. Both of those stories, like I, I lived, while I was doing that door to door stuff, I lived in a, you know, we didn't trade rent, but the guy who was one of the investors in that business at the time had a spare bedroom and I stayed in his spare bedroom for all, for a year, basically like not enough money to go out, hardly enough money to drive. This is, you know, like just, yeah, just wild times. But I don't know, is that necessary? Do you need that to like get to a place like this? You know, do you kind of have to give up on some things to get to a place like this, Joe? Or can you, 
you know, like I'm sure there's other paths, you know, but it seems like a lot of people who do interesting things have some kind of moment where they test themselves like that, right? They test their skills, they test their overall potential, they test like, you know, whatever it is, and they just do it. I, I don't know. Is that a, <laughs> what I don't know what the question is there, but I'm going to stop talking now. <laughs> well, it, it sounds like you had a lot of tests in that. That was a very experimental part of your life mm. with running these events. Yeah. And I think when you like what you do, when you're excited about it, you want to do tests because doing tests helps you learn new things and learn new skills. And if you're not doing those tests, you're just going to do the same thing over and over and over. And if you really love what you do, you usually want to expand your knowledge, expand the horizon mm. of what you can do. So I think it's very natural. It doesn't, you know, when you're doing these things, sometimes you don't think, hey, I'm going to run a formulated test right now. Right. That's not always right. how it is. Sometimes you look back on it and say, wow, I was really testing my skills here and, and really trying to understand how all this worked. But at the time, I was just doing what I felt was right, doing what I wanted to to continue learning on. Yeah. Yeah, I think and, and thinking back on those events, like I'm not an event planner. I never even been to events, you know, like in high school. OK, you go to like the things, whatever the school, you know, you go to the football game or the, you know, I was on some committee stuff. And um, I guess I will give that as a testament to when I was doing my insurance days, I had some time where I was doing I did like three and a half years of insurance before the economy fell apart and ended up like resetting my whole world. Right. This is on my corporate path trajectory where I was shown and introduced to uh, the Chamber of Commerce. And this was totally new for me. I think I've talked about like going to the country club in jeans and getting, you know, like scolded by these. But these same folks like introduced me to the Chamber of Commerce and they introduced me to like formal in-person networking. They introduced me to kind of how like schmoozing works and how like, you know, relationship development works so that you can sell a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of, of insurance policy to people. Um, and they introduced me to in that Chamber of Commerce, I got involved with a group called the Young Professionals. And through those Young Professionals, that was my exposure to organizing events because I then sat on this planning committee and us as a group were responsible for hosting little mixers once a month. And, um, you know, we had a little committee for political activism or uh, for whatever other committee for like volunteers. So we'd, we'd do little things in the community where we'd go clean up a beach or we'd go clean up a roadside or, or build with Habitat for Humanity. And so like through organizing these things, I was like, oh, hey, look at this. And so that early exposure, I think, was the only like as I was thinking, Joe, like where did it even come from as I'm thinking about testing? Because like throwing events is hard. You know, and so that little bit of exposure gave me the confidence to just say, hey, we're doing cool stuff, you know, and the next thing you know, this little committees are getting recognition from different people are in the community. And you start realizing like, oh, it's just like a few people get into a room. We meet every at some kind of cadence, whether that's daily or weekly or monthly or whatever it is with an objective of planning a thing. And if you do that consistently enough, people just start showing up. And I was like, wow. And then and then not only that, but then you start seeing like we did this big on the back of trying to launch some software we got really involved that's what that sarasota underground thing was and that's why we did this big town hall event um and so this town hall was like part of our marketing to get community together because we were trying to build some software for community stuff um and when you then start seeing that you can push the levers of society that you can get involved in politics that you can like make these things fun you just start seeing like oh it's just people right this whole world is just people on the ends of activities and behaviors and engagements that you know, somehow lead to money or relationships or community or something. And I, I don't know, it's fun to see how that evolves into careers. So, um, yeah, talk about and testing. Like, it's just a wild ride. You never know where they're going to go. You never know. And I like to think that Webflow, using Webflow as a platform is always a test. The first time you go into Webflow, it's a test because it's not like something you've used in the past. Mm. You're either coming from no knowledge or zero knowledge, and you're learning this web development industry from the beginning. Of course, that's a major test going from nothing to now Webflow. Maybe you were on a different platform. Maybe you were building on WordPress or Squarespace or even something like Wix. This is a totally different platform than those. So this is a test. Just the idea of using Webflow is a test in itself. Right. 
So we've all done it. If you use Webflow, you've you've done a test already. Yeah, and and specifically betting on Webflow is a test. You know, mm -hmm. betting going all in on Webflow, betting on Webflow means you know, like just we got a lot of faith in in a product. You know, and we've talked about all of the reasons why that might be good or bad. You know, on this episode over the last year and a half, we've had a number of discussions about, you know, is, is, it, is it a problem because it's not open source? Is it better because it's this, it's that, you know? And so uh, this is test, this is a test. And then not only that, but then it becomes a test about, can you learn the newest skills? Can you keep learning the newest skills? Because it's not just a test once. You know, I see all these people taking this Webflow certifications and I'm like, okay, I start thinking like those are good certifications for base level stuff, but like, what is, are those certifications good for a year? Are they good for six months? Are they good for five years? Um, and so, because this is a constant iteration, so you've constantly got to be learning new skills and testing new skills. And then not only do you have to learn the skills, but you got to go sell yourself or you got to get a job. Who was it? Somebody asked here, Rahul, I wanted to bring this up. How often do you guys think of just giving up and getting some boring nine to five job? Not going to happen. Not, not, not ever. Like Joe, like, yeah, like it's impossible. It's not, it's not, it's just, I, um, <laughs> one of my old, uh, blogging topics was this from un unhirable to unfireable. Cause there was a time where I tried to get a job, but I didn't have a college degree and I didn't have the credentials and I wasn't, you know, didn't have experience in this workspace. And you know how many like interviews I'd get at places for marketing stuff and like the schmuck who was interviewing me, I'm like, dude, are you fucking kidding me right now? And then I just wouldn't even be considered for the job because I didn't have the pedigree. Again, I didn't have the paper, the, the, whatever it was beating my head against that for 10. So no, not a chance. I go back. And I don't think I, Joe, I don't think like you just, nobody could afford you. <laughs> like yeah. who's going to like, no, who's going to say, and who's, and who's going to give you the freedom to do what you're doing? Like never, nobody ever. Yeah. It's, it's really not an option. That's a, it's a great feeling. Um, I'd prefer to just not have any money and live very simply than taking a nine to five at a very high paying company where I do not have that flexibility to do what I want, when I want, how I want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we talked, we talked about that and we'll talk about those next week. We're going to talk a little bit about um, finding happiness with work, fulfillment at work, those kind of things. Mm -hmm. um, we've got a couple episodes on that. Um, I think that's important. We talked about that stuff Tuesday, you know, so I don't think we need to rehash that too much, but I don't, yeah, just the idea of nine to five, defining a work schedule, like fixing a, a time frame with which I need to do a certain thing. Um, I like routines. We talked a little bit about that as well, but no, nah, I don't see it. Let's mm -hmm. see. <laughs> Bradford Huber saying super true. I started a small SaaS company and hired developer and was pumped to only do sales through it all. I realized sales wasn't my thing. And after the startup failed, I went deep into web dev. Nice. Yeah. And here you are, uh, Bradford, I'd be interested to know how that's going for you. Like how, how long ago was that? Um, you know, are you finding success in that? Uh, I wonder how many people kind of stumble into this industry for one reason or another. Maybe they were a designer who was working with developers and got frustrated that their designs were being like bastardized in the process. You know, it's like, ah, oh, why? Yeah. And they're like, no, I got to find a way to do this. Or maybe you were a WordPress person like I was where you were wrestling with themes all the time. And then you were like, no, 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 there's gotta be something better. Um, but I don't know what I'd be interested, Bradford, to know just a little bit more about where that's. We can bring up a comment, comment from Tom Voltz, yeah. I believe asking me, so how did you learn JavaScript? Mm. And okay. I don't write JavaScript. I do not know how to write JavaScript. And when I became interested in JavaScript, I became interested in it because I found that every single site that I built needed some form of JavaScript. Maybe not the first two or three where it's super, super simple landing pages. But once it got into any sort of complexity, I found that JavaScript was required. So I became very interested in it. And I very quickly found out that I was not one to write JavaScript. I just didn't even like it. I didn't like the idea of missing a comma and nothing worked. Uh, I didn't like the idea of remembering the syntax and being able to write that by hand. But what I did was I learned how JavaScript works, the logic between, b behind what you can do with JavaScript, what its limitations are, what it can do on a Webflow site, what, what it can and can't do, 
it was the knowledge I needed to be able to talk to clients and tell them what we could do for them. So if I was on a call and they said, hey, we need a countdown timer, instead of being completely clueless about how a countdown timer works, I can now say, yes, we can do a countdown timer. We'll include that for free. We're, we don't even have to do that because I know that this is a relatively simple JavaScript operation. So I learned how it worked. And that to me was really important. It, that was a, I tested, I tested myself in writing it. I tested myself in being a full stack developer and it didn't work. So how did I learn it? I learned it by hiring a JavaScript developer and asking them how every single script worked. If you send me a script, I want comments in it and I'm going to follow up with answers. And I want you to track your time of all the time that you give me answers in because I want to pay you for your knowledge. And this person would explain and explain and explain how all of this stuff worked. After about a year or two, I said, okay, now I can really talk about this. Now I can propose more advanced solutions like CMS library. Now I can really talk to technical clients and understand how to fix those problems with JavaScript. So that's how I learned JavaScript, uh, not to write it, but to talk about it. How much of that, like um, testing with that and kind of beating your head against trying to learn or understand some of that JavaScript led you to just say, once you figured it out, okay, let me just leave this in my wake for others to use as a, as a resource. Because that's not usually, you know, this is not usually, a, you know, this opening up of information and assets like that is something new, I think. I think for a lot of society and most of uh, what we're used to around a business model is to protect information like that and build businesses around those types of little things. And I think something we're seeing in this no code space is that uh, a lot of non-traditional marketing is taking place by turning those resources into marketing assets, which far surpass the impact of let's say some traditional marketing campaign right i hear people talking to me like peers in marketing you know their other cmos and they're like <clears throat> yeah but what about your ad metrics on blah da, da and your you know like your this rate on this campaign with this this da da, da. and i'm like okay yeah but like y'all are just running ads and so joe this leads to a different thing like what led that because it's a trend now and lots of people are doing it but this is you, you were on the edge of that and it's still not fully, like not everyone's doing this, but the, the yep. smart folks are, right? This is a whole new transition in how people are building businesses. They're just giving away products, you know, that then through that becomes the building of an audience that lets them build something really like next level, which I think is a long-term vision here. So what was the spark in your head struggling with learning that JavaScript or on this process that was like, I'm just going to leave this also as a bridge for other people to use so they don't have to do this process themselves. That's what F and Suite Webflow hacks was. Our Fin Suite hacks was me trying to learn this information and share it at the same time. And fun fact, for the first one to five hacks, I had no idea what I was talking about, <laughs> all the way to the point where I was literally reading off the comments. So if you look at those early videos, you'll see that what I'm saying matches the comments exactly because I literally did not know what to say. Mm -hmm. I knew how it worked. I knew how the classes matched with the code, but I didn't know how to explain it. So hacks was my way to actually learn it by doing it, by experiencing it, by teaching it. And maybe I wasn't, I wasn't the one coming up with the content, but I was the one presenting the content, content. So this JavaScript developer that helped me learn it and understand it was the one that commented through all this code. He was the one that started teaching everybody and I was just the good presenter that made that happen. And after a few hacks, I really became confident talking about this stuff to the point where it let us now start to bring in larger clients. So when a client had a more technical spec, instead of being clueless about talking about it, I now have 15 videos out there where I have experience talking about it. Mm. And now I sound more natural on the call. Right. And I actually know what I'm talking about. So yeah, it, it, it was a little bit of me learning. It was a little bit of, hey, let's do some marketing. Let's help some other people. Let's make some friends. And it all just worked. And it was a big test, a huge test. I had no idea if Hacks would be successful. No idea. I thought it would be successful, but really I prepared for nobody to watch that at all. 
because mm -hmm. at the time, nobody was using code in Webflow. This was a very rare, rare thing. So it was, it was very different. Yeah. <clears throat> Damn, I had just a, a little thought in my head. Now I lost it. By the way, we're at 86. Let's get a buzzer today, y'all. Stop Ooh, playing around. Hit nice. that like button. Let's get a buzzer today. <laughs> uh, by, <laughs> 89, see as I say that. Um, I think that is part of... Oh, okay, this is where I was going to head. Um, one of the things about testing is being willing to maybe be wrong. You know? Like, maybe finding out that like your assumption was not right you know and that's the hard part of figuring out that like that's i think that's how you learn right i i, I always love the phrase uh to improve is to change to perfect is to change often you know and it's such a simple term because like there's so much depth there that like yeah if you change something okay maybe you improve something and then you're like oh this is better and you keep going but was that all the improvement or was that only one version of improvement and maybe like you got to test other things and so this is the beautiful thing about software and agile development and things that like two years from now when people hit that attributes website they're not going to know what v1 of it looked like they're not going to care about you know any issues we had with this that or the other or with you know maybe a little thing didn't have parity to the cms library while we built out all the features or whatever the, the thing is now that like we're looking at we're like oh we got to get this all for the community right that's important to us we will solve all that but as you solve those things you create other things and then you reskin it and then you repackage it and then you refine it and then next thing you know it's something totally different and people see that and they're like holy shit and maybe one day it gets repackaged as a whole different thing you know or a piece of it does or some other product comes out of it that then becomes another thing and it's like damn that was birthed from this and people see that and they're like oh i want to build that well sometimes you can't build that until you test all these other little things you know, until you try and beat your head against some stuff or maybe fail or test your assumptions and find out you're wrong. Maybe your skill set is not as good as you think it is. You know, maybe the market and, and maybe you maybe, maybe not. Let's put it that way, because skills are, you know, like, but maybe the market doesn't agree that your skills are as good as you think they are because you're not making the money. And that's a couple things. You're either not getting in front of the right people or you're not finding the right way to present your skills. You know, so like there's so much opportunity in this space and people just looking to get online that I think uh, being self-aware and we talk about this a lot. Um, it makes a big difference, you know, but don't be scared to test and fail and find out that what you need to be doing is just a slightly different version of that thing. If you don't test it, you'll never you'll never learn that. I would continue that to say you need to be ready to fail. Mm. This has to be one of your potential outcomes with your test. So I'm running this test. There's a possibility that's a huge success. There's a possibility that it's a, a moderate success. Maybe it hits my low expectations. And there is a very real possibility that this is a terrible idea and this fails and it's completely wrong. You have to be ready to accept that outcome. And I think what, what, what really separates successful people in business is when that failure comes, you continue testing and you continue moving. When you test and you fail and you quit, well, that's it. You don't have any more tests. You're done. Now you're going back to the nine to five or where the, the safe space where you don't really get to do what you want to do. So you have to be ready to fail and you have to be ready to do another test until you get it right. Yeah. That's how you start your business and continue to grow it. Yeah. I think that's the key is that willingness to just shift and pivot and, um, be willing, maybe not expecting a full failure. Like you don't want to expect failure in the context that like, if you only have $5,000 in the bank, you're going to go hire two new employees. You know, like that's a, expecting a different kind of failure. What we mean don't here, try to fail. Yeah. <laughs> what we mean here is uh, expect that some of your experiments are not going to play out as you assume, you know, that not every little thing you think is right is going to play out in business in a meaningful or productive way. Um, <clears throat> it may present you with new information. It may help you find your direction. But yeah, that's where you should expect a little bit of failure. Um, and going back to Bradford, who made the comment earlier, um, he was saying it was two years ago. So in that time, he's learned WordPress and eventually found Webflow, currently freelancing full time and have been able to hit his income goals and still have some flexibility, which is great. Nice. Right. So I see a little testing in there, a little WordPress, you know, a little Webflow. And I'm trying to remember uh, starting started a small SaaS company. Right. So this is coming from before. Here's the previous comment from Bradford. 
um, hired a developer and was pumped only to do sales, thought then, you know, realized sales wasn't his thing. And that's when he got into web development. So two years ago, he says that it took him word, learned WordPress, now Webflow and a little bit of flexibility, making a little money. That's it. That's the path. You know, so many people just jump into this game and they're like, oh, it's like six months in, I'm not making money. Well, sometimes six months isn't enough. You know, sometimes it is. Sometimes yep. it is. I think being a, a SaaS founder and having some technical background is very important. Mm. Um, I know I felt I felt a little bit lost in the web world, in the web flow world, until I got that technical knowledge. Once I got the technical knowledge, that's when I said, okay, now I understand how this works. I can actually describe to you what's happening when I build your website and deliver it to you. Yes. But I wasn't able to do that last year and it, it made me feel weird. But you keep pushing through it and you get that information, you get that knowledge, and now you're at a different place in your career and you have now an opportunity to do a new test. This is the real value I think that NoCo provides rather than a Squarespace or a WordPress or any of these other platforms that kind of abstract that stuff away is that it, it forces you to learn more technical stuff. As the deeper you get in, the more technical you want to get. You know, and so um, I don't know. I think that's one of the unique differentiators when people are like, what defines no code versus, you know, like something that people are calling no code, but maybe doesn't really fit the bill because they're like no code's a buzzword and literally everything's no code now. Um, so uh, and when everything's no code, nothing's no code. But that is the goal. I saw this interesting thing the other day from uh, GitHub and they were doing some things where like um, in the code markup. They had some uh, just some some stuff you could add to make the markup look more like a, like a nice rich text element, and I'm like, oh look, developers trying to make their code look more user friendly, more readable, right? And here we are trying to make text operate more like code, and it's like two opposite sides of the spectrum trying to meet each other in the middle at some point. You know, the developers are trying to like figure out how do you make this more human, more readable, more accessible. And we're trying to figure out how to make the stuff that's more readable, more accessible words, design, visuals, et cetera, more like code, more functional. How do we do more, push the limits of this stuff we can do visually with the technical back end? And those things are merging right now. That's the, the beauty of everything that we're seeing right now. So, um, oh, and on that note, that's it. It must, nice. have, been, it must have been that little rain. <laughs> Got him, y'all. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Okay, let's bring up a, a comment from Briona here. Yeah. I really enjoy JavaScript, but the only way I'm able to learn it is by building games. This is a nice one. Sometimes you have to find the way that you like learning the best. Some people may learn really well from a tutorial video. Some people may learn really well from a course or maybe formal schooling. But if you say, hey, I love building games and this is what captivates me and what really intrigues me that's what you should use to learn mm -hmm. uh, you know just because you learn javascript through building games doesn't mean you're going to be a game developer you're just you're learning the concepts you're learning the basics and then you can now transition that and say hey now i'm going to watch this person's tutorial because now i actually understand what this person is saying through my game development yeah. So yeah, Brianna, really nice finding what you like and, and running with that. Yeah. Let's see, Nicola Toledo saying, I resisted for two years, then I ran away and it was the best thing I ever did, but I know some are happy with nine to five. It's a mindset. Sure. I think a lot of people do not want the stress of um, kind of being responsible for either your own income or even more other people's income. Um, some people don't want to deal with running the business and generating the leads and dealing with legal and accounting. And some people just want, like, I have a friend who's a super talented designer, uh, works for Toyota, um, not interested. And he could go start a product firm, uh, a, a design firm and, and do whatever he wanted. Not interested. You know, he doesn't want to manage people. He doesn't want to do payroll. He doesn't want to like file for a LLC or do, you know, so there are some people that just want. And, and we, the world needs that, you know, the world needs folks that want to be parts of teams and that work together so that other people can start teams and lead teams and help grow teams and pull those people together to do interesting things. And not everyone, right? Not every part of the, uh, of an engine is like hard metal. 
You know, there's got to be some soft gaskets to seal the, the motor and there's got to be some oil to grease it. And there's got to be some fuel to fire the pistons. And there's got to be some rubber seals around those pistons. And so like everything's got to play a part. And so, um, yeah, I, 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 it's what works for us and what's right for us individually in building a career may not be for you. Somebody might want to just go and be a developer at a firm. You might want to go work for an agency and not have to worry about building a great por personal portfolio and landing clients every month. You know, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. There is nothing wrong with it at all. Yeah, the, I I know several people who love nine to five. Mm -hmm. They love the feeling of being able to close the laptop at 5 p.m. and not look at their work email ever. They have no responsibility to to answer or look at anything after 5 p.m. until 9 a.m. the next day. To me, that sounds terrible. I sometimes I I want to look at things and I want to see what's going on, uh, but that's just we're different people. Everybody's different people, yeah. so that's why you have to find what you like, and you do that through testing. You need to try the nine to five. I always worked myself for myself by myself for my entire life since I was like twelve years old, and that test of working the nine to five was with that SaaS startup that mm -hmm. I talked about in the beginning of the episode. That startup was a test for me. And overall, it was a failure in that I know now I never, ever want to touch the nine to five. I never want to, to, yeah, to work in that type of environment again. But I learned so much from that. FinSuite would not be where it is today without the experiences that I got from working in that position. So there's good things and there's bad things. And then in the next test, you have to use that information to now do something else. Yeah. 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 And sometimes you want to go work for somebody for a while and learn. Or you want to, you know, have a little side hustle because you want to work in one field or you're working in one field, but you want to jump into another field. And so sometimes, you know, you need to have something. Um, when I was making my jump, oh, my God, I remember um, I was a lifeguard. I went back to lifeguarding. Right. So I'm imagine that I come from suit and tie, six figure corporate sales, smooth schmoozing with senators and mayor and blah, blah, all this whatever shit you know, chamber of commerce, blah, blah, blah. and then I'm just back at the pool, you know, sitting there like, and I remember talking to like, there were some regulars that would come in and, you know, they, they chat with you and like the pool's empty. So you just like shoot the shit with all the people that come swimming or do whatever. And it tell like, I'm going to start this thing. I'm going to, yeah. Uh, you know, and for like, you just hype yourself up. But at the time I'm like, a you know, I'm just like this punk kid at the pool, you know, 20, 20, I think I was 26, 27 at the time. Right. Uh, college dropout, living in his mom's basement, had totally floundered at everything. And I'm like writing a business plan about this marketing thing I'm going to start doing. And like, I'm talking to everybody that I can. And like, I'm sure people are looking at me like I'm a total idiot. And they're like, this kid doesn't know a thing, total clueless, going to be a lifeguard the rest of his life. God bless you. Good luck. You know? But I knew that there was like, no, 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 I got something. There's something here like, I, OK. And so I beat my head in one direction and then another direction and then another. And then eventually you find a little thing that works and then another thing that works. And so I don't know. That's like uh, for anybody out there who may be where, where I was or where Joe was five years ago, six years ago, eight years ago, ten, whatever it is, you know, like don't give up. Sometimes like sometimes you'll be the only person believing in yourself. And, and that's important to have that, you know, to, to, to have a little faith in yourself. We have an, an interesting comment from Drift Society. Yeah. I know you probably get this a million times. I'm a web designer with 10 years experience working for other people. Really eager to get out there and freelance, but I haven't had luck finding clients. Okay, so 10 years experience. I'll assume that your knowledge of web design is not the problem, right? I'm going to assume 10 years, you know what you're doing. The problem is how to find those clients, or maybe even how to sell those clients. Maybe people are coming to you and you just can't sell them. Uh, well, I'll start, I'll, I'll start with the getting more leads, communicating with people, becoming a, a very simple marketer and salesperson, 
when you see somebody in this community asking for help, spend some time to help them. You don't know who they are. You don't know if they have, if they're going to refer a client to you next week or next month or even next year. Uh, if you, if you see somebody, you know, with a clonable, Go and create, go and talk to that person. Say, Hey, I love the clonable here. This is such great work. I'm really inspired by it. Thanks for, thanks for everything. Talk to people, get to know people. You don't have to have an ad budget. You don't have to be a master salesperson. Just get involved. Just start talking to people. That's, that's really the simplest way I can say this may help you find some clients without spending any money to find clients. Yeah. Just get involved. Reimar, what do you have to well, add to Well, and that? check out, we got a whole how to sell Webflow playlist. If you go to our FinSuite YouTube channel, right on the home list, if you scroll down about halfway down the page, there's like a how to sell Webflow playlist. I, there's probably like 10 or 12 episodes on there where we've talked about the portfolio, talking to people, the value of hosting, technical knowledge, driving the conversation with questions. Like I would binge that um, and, and dive into some of that stuff. Um, yeah, because I agree, it's probably not web or technical knowledge. It's probably the process of selling. Um, you know, maybe you need a little mentorship or you need to help find somebody that uh, sometimes, you know, maybe you're too technical or maybe you're too focused on the website and, you know, you're not focused on seeing it from the business owner's perspective. You're stuck in it from like the web developer's perspective. So maybe you have problems like communicating the value proposition or justifying, you know, them spending the money for you. And so like there's a million reasons um, but that is the hard hurdle. I mean, that, that is the ultimate hurdle for anybody going out into freelance or starting out on them, their own is getting a consistent lead flow and then turning that lead flow into, you know, real dollars over time. And that hurdle becomes much smaller once you advance in your career. So the hurdle to get clients is the biggest right now for you. You don't have any clients. You need to get those clients. Huge hurdle. Once you start getting some clients and getting more clients and more clients, it becomes easier to get other clients because if you do a good job, they talk to other people, you get to share your work, you get to show off a portfolio and that hurdle becomes low and low and low. And really your goal is to get to a point where there is no hurdle, where there's a hurdle for other people mm -hmm. to now work with you. That's when, that's when it, it changes. You have the hurdle to get clients, you get so good. Now there's a hurdle to just talk to you. So it's difficult, but you can get there. Absolutely. Yeah. Nice. Just been running through, uh, sharing some of the, some of the comments, uh, just on screen here. Bashar says he's late. No sweat, Bob. uh, no sweat. Good to see you here. John Matias says I worked corporate world for years while dreaming of being an entrepreneur, took the plunge in 2016, never going back now finding my way through the no code world to see what's next. Yeah. And the cool thing is you don't, once you get a little momentum and once you get a little consistency, it's, it's cool. Cause you can then start experimenting. Um, somebody was saying, where was that? Uh, Michael Collins earlier. I saw this comment when we asked what people were experimenting with. He said, while waiting for Webflow logic, I've been testing with bubble. Don't kick me out. Um, <laughs> so sometimes you got to look and play and experiment and having enough income you know, to meet your basic needs, to make sure your rent is paid, to make sure you can put gas in the tank and, and feed yourself allows you to have the flexibility to experiment with things like that. So Michael, don't, don't stray too far. You know, you'll be back. I already know this, but, um, yeah, you got to test, explore, find out what works for you. You know, this is a big world of no code here evolving. Um, Steve A is saying a job can provide the financial stability and industry experience required to grow your own business with less stress. A hundred percent. Sure. Sure. You know what's stressing me out, Joe? What? The lack of likes on this video right now. Ooh, lack of likes. 96 watching, 54 likes. Come on, yeah, here, we're, we're gonna have a race. We're gonna have a race to get to the... <laughs> we're not gonna start talking again until y'all, like, until we get as many likes as we have watchers right now. Go. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> we're a bit... <laughs> shame them into the likes every episode y'all uh we'll figure out an hour well, people are still watching you know <laughs> yeah we had a, we had a nice rise all the entire well episode if, this is cool yeah if we look at this like i'm gonna go full screen on this and come here yeah look at the growth chart over the the stream so yeah. it's always fun to see how it happens um 
max i know we were over yeah so what's this sometimes it's not always this 109 max concurrent but yeah look at this growth like over time uh, the average view duration is a little lower than it usually is but that always happens when we get a lot of view counts and we we have an experimental title so that was the cool thing i saw from the experimental title we did um last week was that we got a ton more views on the video but that our watch time went way down so i don't know if that's uh those are good trade-offs this is what we're experimenting with so we're looking to see you know we're talking about testing so talking about you know looking at how does this affect the the performance of the stream in real time you know because youtube's got an algorithm where if they see something going well they're going to start shoving it in front of people and so like how do you improve the click-through rate on that moment but then also make it so that it's valuable for the people who are watching it later and not just only favor to the live audience and create a piece of content that's usable for the podcast later on because we're uploading these as audio podcasts now too and so um, talk about testing, you know, to bring this thing full circle, all of this, you know, talk about building in public, you know, we don't, we don't hit that hashtag a lot, but that's exactly what all of this is. I think we just come out here and lift oh. our skirt a little bit and show the world what we're doing. <laughs> and tomorrow we continue that with a first episode of a new segment. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be our product update stream on the first Friday of every month. And the first one is tomorrow. So we've had a lot of comments about, hey, you guys release a lot of products, updates. How can we know about them? So we're going to have a dedicated stream once per month, first Friday, and it's going to tell you what we released this past month, as well as what we plan to release the next month. Yeah. And we're going to be joined by our CTO, Alex Iglesias. He is the lead developer and creator of Attributes. And this is gonna be a great, great episode. We'll be sharing things. We'll be doing QA. You can ask Alex any kind of technical questions around the products we've released. And we're actually going to be previewing a new one tomorrow, a brand new update to attributes. Ooh. And, and yeah, that ah. is going to be really nice. <laughs> <laughs> tomorrow, we're releasing the S, the automated support service for attributes. And what this is an effort to do is help you better find problems with your attributes implementations. We find that a lot of people just have really simple mistakes with their attributes, maybe a misspelling of a word, or they don't have the right nesting in place, or they're missing a required attribute. Instead of waiting a few hours for support, now we have this tool that you can launch on any attributes implementation, and it's going to tell you what you are missing, what is incorrect, what you can improve on and when you're completely correct. This is a completely correct attributes implementation. It is launching tomorrow at this product update. So if you're an attributes user, definitely come to it. <laughs> yeah, it's cool to see that you just load it up in your browser on a webflow.io domain. Uh, you get an interface that comes right up over your project and it will literally scan the page. You can tell it what attributes should be on the page. It'll tell you what attributes are on the page. It'll tell you what's missing, what should be there. Uh, super cool tool. I think this will solve probably 85% of the support requests we get. Uh, Cause my favorite thing is, hey, this is not working. I'm like, well, probably it's not set up right. No, I promise it's set up right. Okay, well, you sure all the things are, like did you put the thing with the attribute in the right place and then the codes on the thing and the, you sure? Yep, okay. Let's look. Oh, hey, this thing's missing. Oh, yeah. And then it works perfect. Right. So like literally almost every and I guess I got to imagine this is was, you know, Webflow had support issues too. like technical products are hard because at a certain level, how much of it is product and how much of it is just the user did something, you know, they've got a parent container that is just wrong. Right. Or the attributes on a child element, not the parent element or, you know, the attribute is misspelled or whatever, you know, any little thing that comes and that's Again, that's the complexity of code. This is what we're trying to abstract away. But it's, you know, anyway, come learn how we build products and talk tech with us tomorrow. <laughs> that's what we're trying to say. We're trying to help you work faster. Right. We're trying to help you. So you have a problem. And instead of waiting for our support to come and help you or spend an hour looking at the setup, you just open this tool and maybe you can fix your problem yourself in five minutes, in 10 minutes. And that's going to help you now say, okay, filtering's complete. I'm ready to go to the next part of the build. So yeah, we're, we're trying to help you work faster. That's part of attributes. And this support service is now an effort to help you work even faster with attributes. Right. 
Yep. And Joseph, uh, let's answer this question. He's saying, can you use that tool to convert templates and sites not created in client first? No, this is not anything to do with client first. This is a hundred percent attributes. This is going to scan your page looking for the requirement required elements for an attributes implementation. So client first is a naming convention having to do with styles. And, um, it would be very difficult to have an automated tool that would convert that because of the, the way styles work. Like it just, it would not, yeah, that'd be hard. Yeah. <laughs> really hard. Yeah. We're not thinking about that. Yeah. Okay. What's up, David? Okay. Hello. Uh, plus there'll be pineapple goods. That's right. Joe's, Joe's yes. going to cook. Yeah. I'm going to be presenting some, some pineapple based options tomorrow on the stream. So we, we've been joking about all this pineapple, no pineapple, but I'm, I'm somebody that likes to be very open with, with food and how we, we think about weird ingredients together. So I just want to have, I kind of want to pitch you on the idea of being more open mm. to pineapple. That's really my goal. Oh, me? Everybody. Because I love Everybody. pineapple. Pineapple is like one of my favorite fruits. Pineapple with pizza. No, specifically. no, no, no. See, you with lost ingredients me. Now you of lost pizza. Me. No, no, you lost me. That's where the pineapple pizza salad it's comes over. in. It's all over now. It's all over. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> there was something else I was going to say, but now I forget. You had me at pineapple. <laughs> Zach is a jokester, isn't he? <laughs> oh, yeah. I've had drinks with Zach in Vegas, so I know Zach is a, you know, Zach is good people. <laughs> uh, let's see. What was I? I was going to say something, but now I lost it. No pizza, please. That's effing bad. Mm. Yeah. Oh, the smell of vision. That's right. We're beta testing smell of vision tomorrow on our stream <laughs> on the product update stream. It's like the new meta, uh, metaverse. We're going to be wearing our, um, our display goggles, our Oculus goggles, and there'll be little sensors that spray sense right at you. So like, we'll all be able to smell Joe's, um, pineapple concoctions. Yeah, that's a new one. Yeah. Built in Webflow. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> okay, that's it before we make any terrible jokes. Vlad's got the dad jokes, but we've got the bad jokes. <laughs> nice. I like that one. <laughs> okay, that's all <laughs> on that note, Joe. Any final thoughts? That's it. See you all tomorrow. Bye, Thanks. everyone. <laughs>